So the king's men answer his call. I like this quote from Oz Guinness. Oz Guinness wrote the book called The Call. And I would highly suggest that really for anybody, particularly for young people. If you don't know what to do with your life or what God may be calling you to do, that would be a good book to read. But Oz says, referring to the call, he says, We are not wise enough, pure enough, or strong enough to aim and sustain such a single motive over a lifetime. And he's really referring to the call of Christ. What God calls us to do, we in and of ourselves are not strong enough. We cannot call ourselves to God's service by our own efforts. He continues. That way lies faith. Fanaticism or failure. But if the single motive is the master motivation of God's calling, the answer is yes. In any and all situations, both today and tomorrow's tomorrow, God's call to us is the unchanging and ultimate whence, what, why, and whither of our lives. Calling is a yes to God that carries a no to the chaos of modern demands. Calling is the key to tracing the storyline of our lives, not riddling the meaning of our existence in the chaotic world. And it is saying yes to God's call that gives us clarity in a world where there's so many things we could be doing. Right? If I know what God has called me to do, then I know what things I need to say no to. Right? When you get married, you know, alright, I say yes to my wife, and now I say no to all other women. Right? That is you make. It makes life in a lot of ways simple, doesn't it? And so when we follow God and we know what He wants us to do, we know what stuff might be fun, it may not be bad, it might be good or profitable, profitable in some sense, but if it doesn't fit with God's call in my life, I know that that's the stuff I can say no to, right? Because we all have lots of things to do. And that's not a bad thing. Right? But what things do I do? Because I can't do them all. What is God calling me to do? And the other thing I would cause us to think about this. Is the king calling men for war or selling used cars? Why do I say that? Because how often in Christianity does it actually sound like we're selling used cars? Is the opposed to calling people to the kingdom of heaven and joining Christ in a great war against the rebels. Right? I remember when I was going to college and one of our professors, he's a good guy, and I'm not putting him down, but their church, like big church, he had a big church up in Syracuse. And they, he was talking one time, they were putting a radio ad, which I'm not against radio ads for churches, that's fine. Right? But he was talking about trying to figure out how we're going to do it, and he said, you know, um, we were thinking about, you know, hey, you know, your marriage is struggling, or, you know, you're having issues with the kids, you know, come and find the gospel. And, and, you know, on the surface, that sounds good, but isn't that kind of like a used car salesman? Come to us, and we'll fix all your problems. We got what you need. As opposed to, we're going to ask you to come and die. Yes, it's true. If you and your spouse choose to give everything you have to Christ, and work on your relationship and your marriage, but Jesus didn't say, come to me and I will, ma I will make your marriage better. Jesus didn't say, come to me and all your kids will turn out the way in which you desire. Those are not promises in which God made, are they? And that can be hard for us to accept sometimes. But God is calling us to something much more higher. And all those other things are a result of, but we must ask ourselves, What is God calling us to? The king is calling us to war. And let me tell you something. It's a lot harder, that's a lot harder to sell, isn't it? Think about it. Used car salesman. Hey, you want a cheap car that gets you where you want, that has these cute little futures? We know the roll-up windows out of style, so we got a nice little power window for you that like power windows. <coughs> we got or Say goodbye to your family. 
strap on a gun, you might get blown to smithereens, you get to eat garbage, you don't get to decide what you get to do with your free time because you don't have any, you're in the army, right? You will do what you're told. Which one sounds more appealing to you? Right? But the king is calling men into warfare. He's calling up volunteers. That's the good news. He's not drafting people. You're not forced into this. You get to choose. And you get to choose with your eyes wide open. Or at least, as we'll see, that is what Elisha got to do. And I would argue that's what Jesus told his followers to do. I don't think we do a good job of that today. I think we like to trick people into following Jesus. And to saying, hey, here's what it means to follow Christ. It is really good. But it does cost. And so we're going to see here in the call of Elijah, we see the call, the king calls the men, man, and we see that God's men respond to follow the king's call. So, the king through Elijah is calling Elisha. So we're talking about Elijah, right? He was up on, he was up on Mount Sinai. God gives him a commission. He says, go anoint these three people. So he leaves, and now he finds Elisha, right? And he finds Elisha plowing in the field, right? Now it is important to note here that Elijah is not the one calling Elisha. Because why? God told Elijah that Elisha was his man. God didn't say, hey, Elijah, pick somebody. Elijah didn't say, hey, God, I think this would be a great option. No, God told, remember, Elijah thought he was the only one worthy to follow God left. So he doesn't have anybody else to think about here. And so God tells Elijah, I have picked Elisha. He is going to take your place. He's going to help you. Go anoint him. Go call him to follow after you and train him to follow me. Okay? That's your job. Train your replacement. So Elijah goes. That's where he finds Elijah. And this is important. God's men are called by God. God is the caller. You and I cannot will anybody to be God's man. God will raise up his, man, his lady, but he will do it. And he'll pick the people he would pick. Now, sometimes it's important to understand that God will use, right? He will use people as instruments to call, but do not mistake the instrument for the call. This is important. Because Elisha, right, God does not speak directly to Elisha here, does he? At least not from the text, right? He's there working. Elisha, we'll talk about this in a minute, throws his coat on top of him. <laughs> and he's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go follow you. Okay? Now, God sometimes calls directly with Moses, right? Moses is burning bush. God speaks directly to Moses. Hey, Moses, I have a job for you. Um, we see that even Elisha, God has certainly at this point spoken a couple times directly to Elisha. But here, he is speaking to Elisha through Elijah. We also see an example of this in Acts, right? When we talked, when we read last week, right? The apostle said, we need qualified men to do this job. God has given us, particularly Christ in the Gospels, He has given us a picture of what a godly man looks like. So go find a godly man who has the capability of doing the job. Pick them. We will then show that God, when they lay their hands and pray for them, we're going to acknowledge that these men are called by God take care of the widows and orphans. Okay? So, I would argue that God still called those first seven deacons, but he did so through the people. Because the people were able to recognize it was still God doing the calling. But this is very important. We've got to be careful. Because when you go about, say, as a church today, calling a pastor, or calling up deacons, that is why we have to use scripture, no scripture, because that tells us what we're what somebody who's called by God looks like. So that we're not making things up to fit us. Okay? And then we end up calling people into service that God hasn't called into service. And that is not good. 
And you end up like our modern day situation where you have lots of people now that will like say, I'm a prophet, which is usually means like, worked out the future. Has you ever gone through an ordination where you had leaders in the church like check you and ask questions and check out your prophecies to see if you really are a prophet? I bet you they'll say no. Well, then. But we always like to say, well, do we need the affirmation of others? No, we need the affirmation of God, and He a lot of times works through people who are following His word. Right? Is there evidence that what you're saying is true, or are you just making things up? And those things are things we should take very seriously. So, we see that God is the one who does the calling, and sometimes He uses His other men to call other men. Elijah did not, as we talked about, did not pick Elisha, as we also see in 1 Samuel. Right? Another example of this is 1 Samuel. What, what's in 1 Samuel, right? First of 1 Samuel 16, 6 through 7. What do we have? We have the prophet Samuel going to pick a new king. And he goes to Jesse's house. And Jesse brings the first son out to Samuel because God said, you know, it's one of Jesse's sons. He didn't tell him who. And so the first son comes out and, and Samuel says, that is one buff dude. Now, I read the soccer game the other day. I tell you, the two team captains from the one team, they were impressive looking fellas, let me tell you. Right? They're the kind of guys you send out to just because they're big and scary looking. You try to scare them in. Those were big buff dudes that were athletic and fast. And Elijah says, this guy, this guy would be good at protecting us from the Philistines. You know what I'm saying, right? And God says, no, he's not it. Because I look at the heart, you look on the outward appearance. He's not the God. You see, that's why God is the best, isn't he? When it comes to call. Because he knows who people really are. And we tend to make errors based on outward assumptions. Now, it is worth noting that when David does come along, right, David is probably, when you look at the text, let's go there. So the first Samuel, it's interesting. It would certainly appear that David wasn't um, a slouch physically either. Right? Now it is true he's the youngest, in which for that time that's a big deal, right? To pick the youngest opposed to the oldest. And so God very often does call people from places in which we do not expect. Okay? But it is interesting, in 16, let me jump down here, verse 10, so 16, verse 10, And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest. But behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was Rudy. I've heard some commentators say that means he had red hair. So David was a redhead. That explains all the fighting he did, doesn't it? Sorry. <laughs> and it had beautiful eyes. Good looking eyes. And was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for he, for this is he. And see that again, that just goes to show we can't tell by the outward appearance. So it's not like David's brother was, man, he was a good looking fellow, and David's this little <coughs> weak whip over here. No, no, David, he, he was a man's man too. He was big, he had some muscle, I mean he took care of sheep, fought out, you know, bears and lions. So so he, he was a man, right? But it God judges on the heart. But this is the other thing, too. God picks men who have the ability to do the job. Right? Because what was David called to do? David's going to be called to go to war. Right? He's going to be a warrior. So it's not so much that he has to look the part. He has to be the part. Right? The king calls <coughs> able-bodied men. And that's why I would say here, but we're not going to go there, but we have a reference don't misunderstand 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 31, which says that God doesn't call the, the wise and the smart and the intelligent of the world, but he calls the foolish things of the world. That's true. God does not pick what the world picks. God does raise up men from places the world does not expect. But he does choose able-bodied men. God doesn't go and say, 
there's an idiot. He has no idea what he's doing. I think I'll put him in charge of my church. Okay? God, God's not going to do that. All right? Why? Because he who is not faithful in a little won't be faithful much, will he? Right? And so we see that David here is good, and we know this from other places in Scripture, as being what? A shepherd, which is really good if you're going to look after people, right? Because he, 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 he fights off lions, we're told, and believes bears, we're told that he fights those things off. He is a good shepherd. He takes care of the sheep. And so what does God do? Give him a bigger job. We have Elisha, and there's no reason to think that Elisha is not good at what he does, which in this case is plowing. There's no reason to think that he's not a good farmer, that he's not good at his job. And see, I would really encourage, well, all of us, but particularly the young people here, again, is don't think that little jobs, these little jobs of feeding calves, making dinner, cleaning your room, doing homework, checking the oil and the equipment before starting it, visiting grandma and making sure you use proper spelling and grammar in your school papers as unimportant. You would be wrong. For what does the king say in Luke 16.10? He says, One who is faithful in a very little is awful so faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. David was faithful in a little. He was faithful to the sheep. Elisha, there's no reason to not think he wasn't faithful in the little that he was entrusted with. And then God calls them, calls them to do incredible things. You see, that's the whole thing with the heart, isn't it? See, one of the ways you can tell someone's heart, who they really are inside, is, are they faithful in the little things? So here we got Elisha, and then of course we read that Elijah casts his mantle upon him. Uh, the pulpit commentary makes this point. Already it was seen that the rough, hairy mantle had come to be recognized as the garb of the prophet, uh, as noted in Zechariah 13.4. The prophet's cloak was a sign of the prophet's vocation. To cast a cloak to or upon Elisha was therefore an appropriate and significant way of designating him to the prophetic office. So it's not like Elijah just throws a random coat on Elisha and then he just figures out what it meant. <coughs> Prophets dress a certain way, and so when you saw someone dressed like that, you knew that was a prophet. Just like we will see later in the beginning of 2 Kings, where Ahab's son, the people of Ahab's sons, some of his soldiers bring a report and say, hey, this guy met us on the way, and he said, how was he dressed? He said, well, he was, you know, he, he was a redneck. <laughs> That's essentially what he said, right? Camel hair, right? Leather belt, right? And he knew exactly, he's like, that's, a, that's Elijah. I know who that is. <laughs> See, Elijah probably knew it was Elijah, even though Elijah didn't even say who it was. And Elijah probably had never even seen, actually seen Elisha before in his life. Now, he's heard about him because everyone in Israel heard about it. I mean, he's plowing with 12 other pairs of oxen, so there's, or excuse me, there, you know, there's like 10 other guys there at least. And I don't know about you, but farmers, <clears throat> you know, they tend to talk about politics and other things. And we'll say gossip. But is it really gossip? You know, I'm just trying to figure out the news and what's happening, right? So, so he, he, he would have known, right, what was going on. Right? And so there's like, it's a little hard for us in our culture because our culture has thrown away all of those things. Okay? That you dress this way because that's what you do. And so you don't dress that way unless that's what you do because you are then committing fraud. You're telling people you're doing something you're not. So you, know, you want to dress that way as a prophet. Of course, you probably want to dress that way as a prophet in Israel anyway because prophets weren't exactly, you know, prophets of the Lord. 
So it's just something to keep in mind, right? So, so here is Elijah. He's dressed for her. And so he throws this cloak on. So Elijah un or Elisha understands then exactly what Elisha is asking. He's asking him to take on the cloak and be the prophet in his stead, right? And be as an assistant. And so that moves us from the call to the king's men follows the call. Because what does Elisha do? He actually doesn't think about it very long, right? And he left the ox and ran after Elijah. Elijah passed by and cast his cloak on him, and he left the ox and ran after Elijah. It doesn't sound like it took him that long to figure it out. Now, he did run after Elisha, so he probably must have waited at least a couple seconds for Elijah to get a little bit off from him, right? He thought about it for a second. And there would be a lot of reason for a man like Elisha to, to have a second thought. And to take some time to think about this. Like, for example, Jezebel is murdering the prophets of God. And Elisha just got back from running for his life. Right? Elisha is taking this up knowing that he could end up dead. That's very different than the way we get called into the faith today, isn't it? From the church leadership. Hey, how do you feel about getting martyred? That's kind of a prerequisite with this job. Like, like, like we, ju we just really have no concept in America. And I don't say that's a bad thing, right? I don't really care. That. No, I think that I, I'd rather not face death than following Jesus. But, but understand, you know, faith in Christ used to really mean something, right? Because it really costed you something. You didn't do it unless you were serious about it. And so, here he is, right, choosing quickly to follow. Now, it's, I don't want to beat you up too much because not all men, even men throughout church history, go that quickly, right? I read about D.L. Moody. It took him about six months to a year before he said, all right, we'll do full-time ministry. Now, Moody was a very generous man, but he was, he liked making money, and he was good at it. And it was very hard for him to leave business to go into full-time ministry. And he struggled with it for a long time. But see, at least Moody understood this. Following Christ and doing what Christ is going to call me to do will cost me something. Now, Moody thought he made the best decision ever. It was dying day if he would have told him that. So it doesn't mean it wasn't hard when he made the decision. That's the thing. The king's men follow at all costs. We see Christ, right? What, is, what does Jesus say? What, what does the king say in Luke 14, right? The king tells us what it means, what it's going to cost to follow him. So Luke 14, 28. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing. Nope, I'm not in 14. I'm in 13. That would be the error. All right, here we go. 14.20. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who seek it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and del deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet great, Right away off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. He didn't say pastor, church leader. He said like literally the average churchgoer. If you're not willing to renounce all that you have, you are not worthy to be Christ's disciple. <clears throat> now does that mean when you become a Christian, you immediately sell everything and give it all away? No, but you better be willing to lose it all. You may live your whole life and never be called to do that. That wasn't really normal for the early church. And I'm not really sure that was really normal for the church throughout most of history. It makes us uncomfortable. But it is an odd, it's an odd thing that Jesus says there in a lot of ways because that's not how we generally promote the gospel. We don't generally, usually we think the gospel is like, hey, hell's bad, heaven's awesome, and God
God wants you to be awesome. So who wants to go to heaven? Now, I don't want to put down the, we should be making heaven now to be all of that. Because what you get is so much better than what you give up. Okay? So I'm not throwing every, you know, everything under the bus. And that's, but do we ever ask people before they come up, hey, you need to think about this. Because if you're not willing to give up everything, then you're not willing to follow, you're not ready to follow Christ yet. And you're going to give up as soon as you do get to a point in your life where you're called to sacrifice in some way for Christ, you're going to back out. Okay, and, and then what's the point? Right? You're just wasting your time and you're wasting my time. Jesus does that a surprisingly amount of time. Like, hey, either you're serious in your end or get out. Because it's just better for you. And you go halfway. And that's a hard, hard thing. But what did it cost Elisha? We sit down and we look at the text. What does it cost Elisha? So notice he says, let me first kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Right, so this is not like the disciple of Jesus who said, let me bury my father and mother. Because what he would say, my father and mother are alive, I don't know if they're going to die, just let me hang out with them for the next 30 years until they die, and then I'll follow you. Elisha's saying, I, I just, you know, I love my parents, I want to say Bob. And Elisha's like, well, that's fine. Which makes sense, right? Following God doesn't mean we treat our own family poorly, in fact, just the opposite, right? But understand that Elisha, at least some degree, is sacrificing his parents, or certainly, some way, his relationship with his parents. Why do I say that? Well, first off, Elisha, because as best we can tell, he's single. So he probably still lives with mom and dad. Okay. Now, we don't know how his parents respond, right? His parents might have been ecstatic. Yes, we got a prophet in the family. They might have been upset. This is their only son, no grandkids. Well, that... I'm not saying that was their response. We don't know their response. It doesn't say their response. Okay? But certainly, the reality of it is, Elisha has probably lived with his parents his whole life. He probably has at least a decent relationship with them because he wants to go home and say goodbye. Right? I mean, he's treating them well. Right? Probably working in the family business. They may have even been well off because there's 12, or because of all the oxen that were plowing. Um, now, it could be that it was just a communal, all the farmers getting together, doing the work together, or it could have been that they were pretty well off. And so he could be giving up a lot of wealth, too. All right? To go follow Elijah. But he is certainly going to sacrifice a lot of time that he could have spent with his parents. And his parents might have been excited. Maybe his parents are excited and they continue to have a good relationship. Guess what? There's not going to be grandkids, and uh, they're not going to see them very often. Maybe ever again. They don't know when they're going to be married. I think it's fairly reasonable being that he said goodbye that on his journeys, because Elijah's, Elijah's ministry lasts for quite a while, probably in his journeys he stops by and says hi to mom and dad here and there. But it's, it's kind of a goodbye. Right? So he is giving that up. Fellowship with his friends. Right? Because he's, he's, he's going to kill the ox, get this big party, you know, with his friends, you know. Probably he had some good friends, you know. The guys he's plowing with, they joke around, you know. I went rabbit hunting. There's probably some of them that were really bad at, you know, lion hunting, just like there's people around here really bad at coyote hunting. <coughs> <laughs> he's not even here, but I still pick up. It's that bad. <laughs> right? But, you know, he, he may not see any of them again. Right? He has, he's going to have to say goodbye to, to the fellowship that he had with those guys and go minister to a grouchy prophet. <laughs> his livelihood. I mean, he kills, like, his oxen, his ox that he was plying with, they're not for me. Yeah, when they get too old and can't work anymore, you can butcher them. Right? But it'd be like, you know, someone plowing the day, someone says, hey, come follow me, and then, all right, I'm going to drive my, drive my tractor to the scrapyard. Oh. Right? 
right? I'm going to sell my tractor and then give the land to the poor. I am done. Like, he is severing all ties. So he is giving up his livelihood here, his way of providing for himself and his family when he slaughters the ox. That most likely is the point that he was making. He probably even used the, uh, his plowing utensils to prepare the meat, just, to, just as a step further, like, I am giving this up. I am done with this. I am a new one. And his reputation. He's going to be a prophet of Jehovah in Israel when Ahab and Jezebel are king and queen. Not the most popular profession. But yet, Elisha goes in faith, and I think, in joy. Because, here's the thing, what does Elijah get in exchange for all these sacrifices? He gets the kingdom. He gets to be God's man to a people gone wrong. He gets to bring the word of God to people who have forgotten God. He even gets to bring the word of God to some Syrian general of all people and see him converted. He's going to see some unbelievable things. He's going to see God strike an entire army blind. He's going to see God's army of chariots in the sky. I would say, when we continue to read about Elijah, what Elijah gained and what he gave up looked like pity. But,
Remember, the king does the call. We saw this. Elijah, she comes, finds Elisha, wow. I can make some jokes at the expense of um, urban America, but I would pray. <laughs> the king's men follow the king's call. That's the other thing. The king's men follows his call. And then I'll leave you this quote from Osgiyas. Calling is the truth that God calls us to himself. So decisively that everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested with a special devotion in dynamism, lived out as a response to his summons and service. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for the dead. We thank you for the truth.